Okay, that's fine. Okay, uh, and I guess I want this to be interactive. It's not going to be that polished. But um, start out by, uh, okay, next one, I guess I got to click the arrow. Click the arrow. There it is. So I've spoken to this group before, and I mentioned <clears throat> let me get, history going back to X10. And the last time I spoke, I did show all the wiring in the basement. That's still there. Uh, but the code has sort of gotten old. <clears throat> it, you know, I first started programming this in the mid uh, 90s. So, you know, after 25 years or so, I feel the code's getting a little aged. And I continue to fully understand it anymore. <clears throat> and you also need to move beyond the X10 legacy. Um, and I was already starting to do some things like adding JSON messaging, but speaking for C sharp and, and everything, it was getting complicated to support all the different devices. Uh, and I also was getting annoyed with uh, IIS, which is Internet, Internet Information Server on Microsoft, which again, was nice when it first came out, but you know, became a pain. So in August, I decided why don't I tree, do a rewrite so I could understand the code? It, I expect it would take a few months before I convert it over, but it was actually within a week or two, it was already working better than the old code because I so shifted it that the central engine was not as critical as it was. Um, and it allowed me to then integrate all the pieces. And TypeScript is actually a great language for this. And you know, I, you know, if we're in a Python world, I would say Python but I'm, I'm partial to TypeScript. Now, TypeScript is JavaScript with annotation, which saves me for myself. It's a pain otherwise. Um, and it allows me to basically use pieces of code and multiple things as libraries without having to really form the libraries. But I, I did I built a lot of other tools. My knowledge is all in the tools. So if I need to figure out how to do something, I have to look at the code to understand it. This gets to the question of how, my coding style is the code itself should be the comments. And I should be able to pick it up 25 years later and figure it out from local context. Again, as an aside, that was the thing for assembly language. I probably in assembly language, some people leave things in registers, of course, 15 pages. And you make a change. Oh, this register looks free. Nobody's using it. Little did you know it's lurking there. So I did learn to be paranoid. And the big changes included, as I said, learning to do certificates. I, if you're interested, I can tell you more about the tools I built for that. I've learned how to write web servers from, from scratch, mainly using Express. And some of this stuff I could learn doing my own website. Uh, and the really invaluable help in the last few months has been ChatGPT which has helped me discover all sorts of obscure libraries, which I didn't know existed. But back to design point of connectivity. So this slide skill scare, I was gonna say women, little children, uh, you know, not to be sexist, you know, people, little children. Oh, it moves automatically. Um, so this is the way it sort of, um, it works. Now, I can focus on just these two devices and the complexity disappears. This is the key The key point, is you tame complexity by being focused on just the task at hand and everything else disappears. That's the secret of how the internet works. You just look at the endpoints. You don't worry about all the crap between. It disappears and is irrelevant. The other thing is, um, oh, it's auto advance. Um, oh, I know. Okay. Don't complain. You, you see, uh, where's my pointer? This thing here, if I can get the highlighter. Oh, highlighter. So how many of you know about the ESP32? But before the slide goes away, the relationships are defined by these numbers. So that's all. It's like an, basically the IP address. Okay, the slide's moving. This is, the reason it's in order is I took the slide from another deck and I think it had a life of its own. So I'm gonna go back and see if it's gonna let me go back. No, here? Okay. So, um, as I said, the relationship 
is defined by identifiers, not wires. And that's the big thing, shift in emphasis to that. And the ESP32 is a $2 chip with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And it's currently inside all these devices. So these devices each have a web server, full HTTPS, and all these protocols. Um, so that's the great simplification of framing. And the point, as I got ahead of itself, uh, is that these relationships work across the entire world. So anything in, in my house does not stay in my house, to misquote uh, the Las Vegas thing. I'm doing a design here that's meant to scale globally and support applications. So the, often I use the application of the connected pill bottle, which does not exist now because that crap in the middle called the telecommunication industry is insisting on getting, you know, preventing us from communicating for no reason other than collecting a fee. But the important point is it's those abstract relationships that are what we're trying to preserve and that are the center of things. Not, it's not command and control, it's the relationships. So you know, stepping back, the key thing is I learn by doing. Uh, and the system is live. So my, if it's not set up right, my life's are not gonna work. So I've got to design a system that's resilient. And even while I'm debugging, it has to always be working. So that it, it might seem like a hard constraint, but it's really what forces me to be honest and understand things. And it keeps the complexity bounded. Um, and it turns out it's, it's not a bad constraint because bugs show up. The real problem is that the system is so resilient, major aspects of it can fail and I don't even know it. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's hard to find a bug you don't know exists until enough other things fail that it shows up. So it has to, again, work unattended for months at a time. Uh, the key components of that are resilience, means if something doesn't work, you handle it. You don't just say, okay, I crash. No, that's not an excuse. It's got to continue working. The other thing is item potence. Now, how, how many of you, like, there are no hands to be raised, know what item potence is? They teach, Chris, do they teach you about that in class? Uh -huh. yeah. Randall, say something. Let me get rid of the microphone thing. So for some reason, obscuring whatever. Was there a hand up? If you just want some feedback, yeah. Um, I know item potence as a mathematical concept, and um, but, so I, I think I know what you mean by it here. Okay, I'm looking at the chat, which is going to be tiny. I'm going to have my notes are going to be reading the chat, but yeah. Yeah, but in programming, it means I can send the same command again and again. It'll give the same results. So that's a key part of resilience. Sort of like multiplying by one. Well, yes, or sending yeah. a turn on command if you send it on again. Mm -hmm. You don't do toggles. You do a turn on because, you know, so you send it a few extra times. If Wi-Fi lose a few packets, so what? You send it again and keep pounding it. So those are things that are key to sort of be able to, to get the, all these parts to work together. I also try to avoid single points of dependency, and that's a tough one. I'll get to that later. Uh, there are also multi, but whenever possible, there are multiple paths. So I can reach a device by direct IP message, sometimes by going through Hubitat or Home Assistant. I don't know if you're familiar with those. So Hubitat is a box it, sort of the, uh, that was based on the original smart things from Samsung, which they spent $200 million on. People got rich and basically Samsung failed. And home system, but these enable me to embrace a lot of devices. And that's one of the big changes from sort of the Intel X10 world. I now have many devices. And I've got shims when I need to in addition to those. And I just started using MQTT, even though I'm afraid of depending on MQTT broker, which is running on the machine back there. That's the one. Uh, if you see little lights flashing, that's the MQTT status I wrote. Um, so one other thing I won't get into is the, how do you model these devices? One of the, the bugs in my early system was I was mainly focused on the concept of turning lights on and off and things like that. Uh, what one of the you know, things I learned about from the smart things is to treat each capability as sort of a different virtual device. So you can have the black and white fa the face of the bulb which controls the power. There's another one which is the color face of the bulb. So all these devices have interfaces, which is an idea I was familiar with, but hadn't implemented. 
It was actually part of what was supposed to be UPNP, not the, the terrible thing they adopted. So um, let's see. This is clicking ahead. So the whole design is about cooperating elements. So there is the main engine, which is still there, which is databases uh, and main, basically provides here the status of all the devices and acts as a switching center. And my goal is to reduce the reliance on that. Right now, for example, it mediates all MQTT messages. But I now know how to listen for MQTT messages in the web browser so that device, devices can now speak to MQTT directly listen for changes. Um, and, I, you know, I discovered only about 10 messages per second, which is not too bad, but I still have to figure out all the scaling issues and things. But one thing that um, writing the web app that I, I think I've shown this in the past, um, let's see. Oh, if you look at the thing, you won't see it. I won't bother with that. Uh, is that I'm for, I was forced to use HTTPS, which is a mixed blessing because HTTPS is more secure, but it also creates a lot of problems, which is a discussion in its own right if people want. Uh, it also acts as a rule interpreter, which we'll see later. And it runs on my desktop. So I actually implemented the... Uh, control panel, which I normally put up in a slide, as a web app or progressive web app. So the term progressive web apps is a lousy term, but for me, what it means, well, the positive is an app that can run desktop or anywhere, so I can actually run control on anything. But um, the main reason I use it is that in theory, let me hang up on this. Uh, uh, spam call from Shenzhen. Oops, I thought I hung up. <clears throat> okay. Um, where was, okay. So is that it, the web app should be able to run even if my main engine is down. So the way the web app works, whenever possible, it sends commands directly to the devices. Uh, so it doesn't depend on my desktop PC. For... Uh, devices that do not support HTTPS, whether they put HTTP or UDP, I send messages through shim machines, which is running on a couple of Pis and uh, PCs, so it can find one that will relay the message. So this way, it'll work even if my desktop is down. The only problem is right now, the thing I have to debug, is if the web app is not already running, um, it still depends on the main machine to get started, and I haven't had a chance to debug that yet. But again, the goal is to be fully distributed so that the house works even if my desktop is down, the office is down. After a power cycle thing we've had some last week, everything comes back. I'm lying. The power cycle causes problems, but we won't go into all those right now. So these elements include bridges. As I said, I'm using Hubitat which is sold as a box. Hum Assistant is sold. You could buy a box or you could put it on your own pie. As a whole group of community around Home Assistant. So how many are familiar with Home Assistant? Uh, okay. A home Assistant, you should look up. I, actually, I put it off to the side, but my son, who I infected uh, with this, uh, actually got up to speed on it. And it's really very good to have uh, corrupted my son so that he can help out to figure these things out for me. But Home Assistant, I think, is the most resilient, you know, shim, but I haven't fully figured it out yet. But the main thing is it makes a lot of these MQT signaling. And if I didn't write my own direct drivers, there's a good chance some of the Home Assistant world has written one. Um, You muted, you muted, Bob. Okay, good. I got rid of the pop-up menu showing me what mic to use. 
I'm, uh, can you hear me now? Am I can I be heard? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we can okay. hear you now. Okay. Uh, now we have to pay Verizon. Um, okay. So I'm excited about the growth of web de devices with the web server and thanks to ESP32. Not all in web servers, like the whiz bulbs are still doing their own UDP protocol and everything, but a migraine to three main devices. There's Shelly. Let's go to Shelly.cloud. It's a Bulgarian company, which is the one that I think is the lead on this, making devices like this. This is a new generation. I'll get more to that later. How many are familiar with Tesmoda? Anybody with Tesmoda? So Tesmoda is this guy who basically has an open source support for ESP32s. And you can buy bulbs and other devices pre-flashed with Tesmoda. There's also ESP Home, which is another uh, platform from the Home Assistant community. So there's a company called Kaufman, for example, that's selling bulbs with ESP Home. You can flash with Tesmoda, but I decided I'm going to also support ESP Home. So those uh, I can go directly, more directly to, but there's still the problem of supporting certificates in these devices, which are pain. Now the devices which are UDP based, like LifeFix. Sorry, that was not meant to be ESP Home. It was meant to say, let's see if I can fix this on the fly. Where's the slideshow? Before we forget, there it is. That's um, Cooperate Elements. Okay, so we're back. Uh, and Govi is a, is a new Chi Chinese company. The nice thing about the upside companies, they're more open to implementing LAN protocols. Govi started out with the cloud protocol switch to LAN. There's also UPnP, which is Yeelight. Uh, I'll skip my negative thoughts on um, Yeelight, but uh, on UPnP. But Yeelight is trying, and they're sold by Xiaomi. Uh, and there are others, in case. So the main point, uh, uh, typos. Why did the catch these typos? Hey. So embarrassing. This is the audience I'm willing to be embarrassed in front of. Um, progress. Okay. See, so let's pretend there's never the typo. Uh, so th this is still a work in progress. Uh, it's still mainly turn lights on and off, lights and levels, because that's, turns out, all these fancy effects you don't really need. They're good for showing up to your friends on Halloween. I could turn the bulbs orange. But in those cases, my wife doesn't want to do it herself, so I can use the many different apps, because each family has its own app, its own silo. So, yes, I want to make it better. I want to call the temperature better, but I can defer those or rely on things like uh, Home Assistant. Um, I do have an API, so I can write scripting programs. I want to control things. But it turns out the remarkably few scripts I need, you know, maybe to keep the porch lights on, maybe to turn the lights off at night if there's still kids here in the middle of the night. But there's not, the, you know, scripting and automation don't scale because I'm not in a step for uh, house where everything is repeated day after day in lockstep. So that's why camera stuff, I could get them to a home assistant. Home assistant even gives, lets you build a web page. But uh, I want to focus more on understanding and sort of make the mundane things work. So um, now, okay, I'm peeking ahead uh, on where we're going with this. So when I say things don't stay in the house, this is a learning world where you can put a little software everywhere where you benefit by everything is packets or bits. So if you look at AI chat GPT, that works because the meaning is not intrinsic. Everything is reduced to bits. It doesn't matter what they are. So it can find patterns. Um, and that's what enables these devices to maintain the relationship between the endpoints without worrying about what's in the middle. Because once you've normalized its packets, the middle is just sort of a generic transport uh, 
without, and the meaning, I give a separate talk on voice or repeat, the meaning doesn't exist in the middle, it's just carrying packets. And that's why these ideas scale. Yes, the protocols don't work transparently, but shims and everything I can put in because the IP protocols and apps don't depend on maintaining the timing. That's the problem with approaches like, uh, remember, do you remember FireWire, what a disaster that was, or Bluetooth? Th those have basically timing limits around trip assumptions and everything. Uh, and they become brittle, de brittle dependent upon this complicated stuff in the middle. Whereas the whole point about IP is I have to discover on the ground what works. So voice over IP is actually a great example because it only exists because you cannot basically buy priority in the network. In other words, there's no way to buy better treatment for your packets. You can get a, a, a fatter pipe, but that's about it. But once you're in the generic shared network and shared environment. So voice over IP only started working because of generic capacity created for the web. And then it just started working by magic. And the same way, the things I'm doing scale will work better and better as the barriers to connectivity uh, you know, fall. And I can just send generic packets anywhere without having to worry about third parties in the middle. That includes firewalls and other crap, second guessing what I do. Now, on the side, you, so, you see this little thing for the latest Shelly thing, which is why I'm excited about Shelly. Let's see if I can, it's still a pen. This, no, I shut it off. Um, okay, so, okay, we need to go back one, I clicked. Okay. It says highlighter. Okay, so you, you're able to, get, it's not full JavaScript, but you're able to write little codes on the devices. The challenge is that you don't want to write just arbitrary code everywhere, you want standard protocols and everything but you're not limited by predefined interfaces. So you can start to experiment with new APIs. And there will be a lot of harm caused by people getting themselves in trouble doing this. But it, it's a learning opportunity. And for kids programming, it really means you can take the physical world and turn it to software. So that's sort of the direction we're going in with all this. So let me give you an example of sort of some of this in action. So, there are Leviton Lutra. Le, uh, it was supposed to, okay. I said at the time and all the things, so we can tell, I'll tell the story. Uh, so, so much for my being too smart for myself. Okay, so it, when I press the button here on this Leviton, it sends a, a special proprietary radio message to this interface, a like cassetta. That goes over the Ethernet to Home Assistant. From Home Assistant, it goes to via MQTT through another Pi machine sitting back. So these are two different machines it goes through over the network. Then my main machine, which is a little nuke box, is listening for the message. And then it sends the messages. It, well, what it does is it gets the message inside the MQTT handler. It uses HTTPS within that box to send a message to the main program, which then gets the HTTP message from the MQTT listener, which then goes to the rule engine recursively and then sends messages out to all the handlers. So any guess on how long that takes from the time you hit the, that button? Anybody want to guess? Half a second. Close. Oh, I've got to turn off this. If I want to click on it. I've got to go shut this off. I can click on it. So think of how many level, how many steps that goes through. So uh, if the thing is, the design has all these elements. So the problem is, if the MQTT handle is not down, the um, the set of my fail, but um, so this is on one of the walls. I've got these three next to each other. Um, I've got the Lutron, which is nice, but it's a tactical thing. I like the idea of having a physical button I can press. 
Uh, I also have uh, the um, Tasmoda, which is a nice drop-in for light, an old light switch. If you still have a circuit, we control it locally. Uh, this uh, That's basically using a Tasmoda protocol. You send messages, it'll tell you the status. Uh, and this, okay, so Lutron depends that whole chain I talked about. Tasmoda can send messages directly. It can send HTTP messages directly, or it can send messages to my rules engine, depending on what it is. Now, to get a little geeky, so the way the rules engine works is, is the simple rule says, whenever I turn this, hit this, get this message, this device comes on, turn on these other devices. Now, the interesting thing about that rule is there's no difference between that rule and a scene. So, it, so if you look here, you see this image which has ceiling? That's that rule unwound, so the rule can be executed in the device. So the device can I can implement arbitrary complex rules in the device itself. So, so part of sending the message down to the device is not only do I send, okay, this button controls this device, I can send this button controls this family devices, and each of those can have rules. Normally, the rule is just transparent. And the way you get this screen here, if you want to see what's inside, is a long press will pop up the screen so that you can see what's behind the button. Now, this UI needs a lot more work, a lot more polishing, but it focused on sort of this basic functionality. And just to give you a sense of what's up here, so this is extended commands. This allows me to go to other rooms to the main menu. Uh, this is how many seconds it's been running since the last. Oh, there's only half a day? That's strange. Oh, because, no. in any case, an external IP address which turns out to be strange because that's one of my secondary addresses I can't get here. I don't know why I got that. And then the ceiling controls all these at once, which is what you see here. And each of these, in this case, you can actually see the lower buttons. You can't always see it. There's a weather widget. I can have other videos. So the doorbell can announce. So that's basically what you really interact with. And the key point here is that really focuses on the main engine, all this, but the ability, but the real center point is that these apps can run independently each device and cooperate. And I think where the future direction there is, where MQ, so the reason I'm cautious about MQTT is that you, can have, you need to give the name of an MQTT broker. If that broker goes down, you, you can't get the message. So I use them as, as advisory right now. Now, one of the future considerations is resilient MQTT by dynamically changing the name in the HTTP server. But we'll get, again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so here's, here's a, a key slide, is from naming to binding. So when last spoke, I would name a device like K-Sync 3, which means a third device over the, on the sink side of the kitchen and put that in the bulb. So that bulb is now K-Sync 3. The problem is it's part of scene, it's part of thing. If I switch bulbs, I got to move the name for the bulb. The bulb, too much work and too problematic because you get multiple roles. So instead... I keep the native name, which basically, this is really basically the, the MAC address. But the, I don't want to depend on the MAC address not changing. So this, uh, that, that name you see, the cow ball, whatever, is the intrinsic name of the device. There's actually a feature, by the way, of Instant that had intrinsic names. You couldn't change the ID. So uh, it also has a friendly name, but that's secondary on Home Assistant. The main point is that I, the main, one of the major changes on database, and this is why it's nice to use a database, is I separated the binding name, like, or the Mac, you know, the DNS name, from the role name. So I can basically have bulbs, you know, change the role by just rebinding the name. I can make a part of rules point to it. 
And I used to think things are family, like it's a Hubitat device and all this. And one recent change is, no, this device can now exist in multiple paths and be reached by multiple paths. Contrast is Windows. Well, if you have the same printer, but it can be reached over IP or Bluetooth or USB, it's a different printer. Window has no, Windows has no concept that the printer is the same endpoint. So how many of you remember uh, the days of, U, of UUCP? You're old enough, admit it. What address would be A, B, C, percent, question mark, whatever. Worked fine. <laughs> what? Just speak. Worked yes, fine for me. But, well, the problem is you can say A bank, C bank, go 30 levels, but um, you don't know that it turns out the two A's are the same. You can't assume that. So the nice thing about having unique identifiers like this or GUIDs is that you can now assume those are the same. And, you know, and, we, and the ad name separates the path of how you get there from sort of the name. The problem, though, is the DNS is still in the old things where you would name things casing three, or you can have only one Joe's dot pizza in the entire world, or one house of pizza in the entire world. That doesn't make sense. So you can look at my forever URLs proposal, which is we need to fix that. We need to remove uh, the, the semantics for the DNS to give you an option for non-semantic names, which then never have to expire. Now, at the beginning, someone was asking about certificates. Certificates are bound to the accidental character string of the moment. There's a long window. If somebody buys or steals house of pizza, house of dot pizza, you you still go to house of dot pizza, but you'll be going someplace else by separating out you know, the intrinsic identifiers, the GUIDs. This is what we do in all databases everywhere in the world. That's why you can change your name. You don't lose your social security benefits. So what's amazing, and this gets back to Chris's comment about learning computer science. Do they teach you about leaking identifiers in databases? Chris? Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, basic yeah. idea. So you learn about relational databases? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's at some point. Yeah. So how do you link tables in relational databases? Uh, is the join? Yeah, but when you join, how, in other words, the key field. What is a key field? The value of the key field. What is that? The uh, unique identifier. Well, but but it's unique because it has no semantics. It's just a random number. Now, the more recent ideas in databases is the GUID. So you can use simple indexes for local databases, but if you want to have a database that's distributed, where you have data generated in various places, you need a global unique identifier, a GUID. And those are self-chosen big random numbers, and that's a powerful idea. So this is really a core idea in my design that all these linkages are done by global unique things. So I can take device anywhere in the world. It'll be, have the same binding identifier. If I replace it, I change the bindings. So I can have as many levels of indirection depending on what kind of flexibility I want. So I'm going to get to how I handle that. But if you get a chance, you can look at the forever URLs, which is under my keyword system, rmf.vc. So part of this is I can't write all this myself. I'm not going to rewrite, reinvent the entire world. I'm not going to, I'm going to do a lousy job, i got to admit. Like when you discover smart things, as much as I thought that rule engine orientation was wrong, they also did some things far better than I did. One thing they did not do was when I wrote code, sometimes they get a 3,000 line Java uh, stacked up. But otherwise, you know, th they thought through some of this long after I, you know, more recently. So the thing is that root or nat at the edge of your house, some people curse. It's what enables me to experiment and try out ideas and repurpose that protocols without having to fight with people outside the house saying, you're doing it wrong. You're not allowed to do that. Uh, and the other part of philosophy is local first. So everything can expand to the world, but it starts locally and works locally. And locality is a very important principle here. It means even when the power is out, I can still turn my lights, wait. That doesn't make sense. Oh, okay, maybe I can't turn my lights. If my internet goes, connection goes out, my house still works. 
Though, if, if I had a backup generator, I would be able to turn on my lights. It must work locally. It doesn't matter if the outside connection works. The irony is my internet connection is more resilient than my power connection because I've got multiple paths. Uh, one of the hacks I did was recognize that the DHCP server is a DNS server as far as we're concerned. So that... Um, we, I can, for example, my main machine, I want to, if I didn't spoof and shadow addresses locally by putting like my local address in, then if my outside connections failed, I couldn't get to my desktop from the device in the hall. But because I spoof it, so this is, it has a local address, even though the D, it also has a global DNS address for the, through a port forwarding, means local things can work locally. And I can also then put password checking or other credential checking in for external references, but not local references. Uh, and a little aside, one thing I realized is that the problem with the MDNS, if, so I assume some of you are familiar with MDNS, it's sort of the success of NetBias allows you to have local names for devices rather than out the DNS. So a device can call itself, you know, food not local and you can get to it. The problem is that the, if you broadcast things don't work. So by you by registering things in the DHCP server, I then get a persistent name for them. So I basically, I, I mean, this is in addition to my external zone files. Um, so, and then, you know, there are a lot of bridges and shims to the larger world, from the larger world, like port forwarding things. Um, I, the other thing I also do is I rely on Ubiquity to fill in some of the APIs not, you know, available globally. Uh, for example, turns out there's no ma ma uh, mapping of um, IP address to a MAC address. So if the IP address, I want to find the MAC address, a lot of the, or the other way around. In any case... Those mappings are in the DHCP server, and by using Ubiquity APIs, I'm able to find those mappings. Eventually, uh, I'm going to implement more native to DHCP server uh, uh, interfaces so that um, I can basically... I'm not, I, the main point here is the internet was a nice engineering experiment. It was a network of networks. It's still caught up in the idea for the dial-up days of the way we thought about it. Your access, the term accessing the internet means it's somewhere, it's a long-distance phone company. And as a matter of fact, in the early days of DSL, it was exactly that. You would sign up for a long-distance phone company and for your internet provider. Uh, I see it more as peer connectivity and bonding transcends the network of network. The internet is not there yet, but it can repurpose protocols to drag it kicking and screaming into the 1990s. So, yeah, one, so the main thing is the current protocols I build on, build on that is HTTPS, is WebSockets, MQTT, the secure version, the non-secure version. And the big thing is JSON bundles that I can do over everything. Uh, so that's, and I mean, you look at also like Shelly and all, and, um, Desmodo. They all accept JSON bundles, whether they come over MQTT, whether they come over HTTP, whether they come over WebSockets, is a very powerful, flexible uh, approach. As I said, I manage my own certificates. I mentioned before this talk that I do it by having a program that basically does an ACME request. Then I update my DNS zone file. And my DNS... Uh, Zone files managed by a friend of mine who's also actually put a nice thing so dynamic addresses work. I'm not limited by C name. Um, and thanks to chat GPT, I get, if, I can only tell if you're interested in how, I get to search dynamic when you make a call. I see who you're coming from. Oh, here's what you want to reach. Uh, have I got a certificate for you? And then present the appropriate certificate. Uh, but it's still a challenge. These small devices don't make it easy to put certificates in. So I'm still learning how to do it without, you know, breaking the world. So this is, these are all works in progress. But the main thing is, unlike UDP protocols, uh, HTTP, WebSockets, MQTT will work from web apps. 
And why write a native app when you don't have to? So I'm also telling lies. For example, Wi-Fi is the best thing out there, but it's still a disaster. Uh, you, you know, often get devices that don't connect to Wi-Fi. A lot of devices aren't smart about retrying and things. And partially I'm sensitive because I'm in the middle of a reverse failure mode, which we try to spend more time to fix. And it might have been precipitated by the power outage, but I'm, let's put it this way, I'm getting reverse failures. And, and you know, Enough said. Uh, progressive web apps too. I'm still learning. They keep exiting. I suspect when updates the browser on the phone, it'll exit. I don't know what's happening. It does have enough low level access. It would be nice if I could do UDP from it. And the HTTPS restriction is a pain, but in this case, it's forced me to learn how to use HTTPS because I don't believe in firewalls. I want everything to work without a firewall. The firewall is one of these crutches that creates vulnerabilities. But to make all this working, there's a lot of tooling I need. You know, like if you're going to use abstract URLs, you need tools to do it. And I've got a growing to-do list. So the other point is the single points of failure. Wi-Fi is a problem. You depend on access points. Fortunately, you have multiple access points, but you still depend upon them. Um, a single DHCP server, your DNS, all these things, single TTT server, single. So all of these things are concerns for making more distributed. And I, the future direction, as I said, with it, live streaming is on. Live streaming is on. I can echo it too. Okay. <laughs> so speaking of tooling, remember we left ourselves off. Um, you know, I, I, I make heavy use of tools and my knowledge is in all these tools. I decided that it's not so much I'm getting older and forgetting things. It's just my buffer overflow because there's so many different things. Things, if anything, are accelerating the number of different things. So just as, you know, people were concerned when writing was invented, that people would learn, would not learn how to memorize. And that was used to be the main skill. So today I rely on all the pieces of code I've got lying around strewn all over the place when I'm about to do something, I look at the code. So um, it's mostly TypeScript. The reason I like TypeScript is a program is a system with type annotation. I don't believe in strict typing. I will go, I'll, you know, I'm not going to force myself. It's just like, you know, do you remember the days when you were told you weren't supposed to split infinitives because some old biddies from the 19th century thought we were supposed to speak Latin? Uh, uh, so the SQL Server, because I use database techniques, this is why I was asking about learning database techniques, meant I can restructure. That's how I changed from using these names directly to making them binding identifiers. JSON bundles should be JSON bundles. I do depend on ubiquity and like to move beyond from managing on what device to connect to whatever they are. Uh, but they're, you know, not exactly end what I'm doing with this vision. But the other thing is I can quickly now write uh, programs in TypeScript uh, and if you want Python to do things, for example, if I want to swap, it's called swap ball, but it's more general. Where I say, okay, I've just unscrewed this bulb from this socket. The socket, the location is called KSync3. So that's the binding name. But now move that binding over to this other bulb I just put in there. So that becomes the simple command I can type in, and if I wanted to, I could put in my web interface. Uh, thanks to MQTT, if I put a new device on, it'll see a message for the device, go to the device, ask what device you are, figure it out, add it to the database appropriately, automatically. And then I have another program which goes through, finds all the devices, and generates, I just have some, uh, these little labels. Oh, printer just printed out a few. Got connected despite USB. So, so these labels, which I put on every device, this is part of my paranoia. Uh, you know, if it weren't for this, how would I know what device this is? Um, by the way, it also ha does help to have a double E degree, even if it's a fake double E degree. So you learn how to wire these things and electrocute yourself. You know, shutting power off is something for children to do. Um, so I, I should put in a bad word for matter. How many of you have heard of matter? Anybody? So matter is the uh, 
future of home control, home automation, circa the Jetsons. Uh, again, it, it's another example of hardware people not knowing, understanding what they're doing. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning it all is, the, you know, it's one of these things just like the terrible idea of 5G, which is a tragedy of in its own right. Um, you know, it's done by hardware people who do not understand fundamental concepts. Um, and then it's primitive security. It has bit layouts rather than JSON bundles. And you can't do, um, excuse one example from CS, a matter of force it until the committee figures out what the interface is. These are ideas that we abandoned 30, 40 years ago. They reappear periodically in, in C bus, they appear in Firewire and things like that. Uh, and no surprise, it's done by Silicon Labs, which is doing Zigbee and Z-Wave. So I just want to put that to bed. Any case, uh, this is a partial to-do list of things I've got to do. Um, I would ask for help, but it'd probably take more time explaining it than things. So I think this is about time to see if anybody's still awake. Questions, answers. I haven't sure. fallen asleep. I'm still oh. awake. Okay. And for those in the Boston area, if you want to visit, you know, this is, all, this is uh, real life stuff working in action. And it's a way I learned, for example, understand. I mean, a the real value here is what I've learned over the years. One of the earliest lessons was the need for relationship identifiers. No internet protocol allowed me, just in the 90s, to connect the light switch to a mic bulb. There's no, the IP address ephemeral, the DNS you don't own. Uh, that I, all these problems. So this is learning by doing. Uh, and the real lesson has been the shift from when I first thought about, wow, I tried a program turn lights on, to the idea that this peer connectivity, bulbs can send messages to each other, switches can send messages to each other. And the challenge now is to understand and tame that. Because, you know, there's other... When you restrict things, you, you simplify it, but you also you know, build in a lot of attitude. When you don't have any restrictions, uh, you're all over the place. There's no commonality. So I'm trying to find the path of the middle. So people like, so what, for, I can normalize devices so that I have my own standard internal interface so I can control a, uh, an ESP Home device, a Wiz device, and fill up all of my own software and that's similar to what Home Assistant did. So I can leverage their normalization. Now the normalization doesn't mean you get to all the functions, but it increases the span. But if you start to program things totally idiosyncratically, you don't get that leverage. So it's sort of like the open source world. The projects that work have a dictator that, you know, coalesces things or they're built around existing models. So you have an example. Uh, and at some point, they decide, okay, the idea is dead. You switch on and abandon it. You don't need to make it work forever. So I think there's going to be edge of people who will use all the flexibility in these devices to track new ideas. But over time, common ideas like JSON bundles will emerge. There'll be a standard format. But unlike um, the days when, they, when you would build a whole new industry, from CDs to DVDs, quite a whole new industry, we can still use the common packet infrastructure, and that's the really powerful idea. So we have these common levels to build on, just like I use internet protocols. So that's enough of a rant for now. It's 8 o'clock. Um, so those who you passed your bedtime, what questions do you have? Anybody? I'm going to bring this down. I'm going to show the screen sharing. This is nothing to see. Just move on, folks. So stop sharing. Okay. Now I'm able to look ahead and see people. That looks good. Mm -hmm. I'll shut down the slides for two. So my, my first question is, I guess, why? Um, in, in instances where there were other existing solutions to, to accomplish the same problems, you know, uh, did you like, feel need to just the need to understand it and implement it okay. yourself? Okay, let's take an existing yeah. solution. 
you don't want to turn on a light. You could run a wire through the walls, fish through the walls, take it to a switch, and then whenever you want to turn the light off, you slam through the wire, you cut it, you have a little mechanical thing that does it for you. I mean, you could do that. But that doesn't accomplish the idea of you controlling the light. It's just you want yeah. by sending well, a message, getting flexibility. Uh, yeah, I guess I mean like so, like e existing um, IoT solutions that already. Have I, you know, well, first word IoT is terrible, but name a solution. Well, I, I guess say like like a Wemo. Um, yeah, but all of those. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the problem with with Wemo and all those, especially the Toya based ones, is first the terrible architects done by incompetence. Let's put that out to the side for the moment. Uh, the design, they all tend to be depend upon a web a server someplace far away to a monetization engine, close proprietary APIs. They don't play well with each other at all. So you can't mix and match. You're stuck within their silo. If they don't do it, sorry, it doesn't exist. You want to do it in a new device? Sorry, it doesn't exist. But you're stuck back 30 years ago in the Jetsons design point. Now, Wemo, which I think that's the Belk one, right? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They did experiment with open interface, UPnP, but they're also security currency and everything. Uh, so they were, they, you know, so they had a chance to be open. I tried, but they never really got it to work well enough for me to use. Uh, and now they're owned by Foxconn. I don't expect much. Work, but yeah. you take a look at some of the others and they're totally closed. And it, let's you look at, okay, so you look at Philips. So their Philips Hue line, terrible name for a product, uh, is Zigbee based. So they have a pretty open API to their um, bridges. And I can program to that, but depending on Zigbee and all the other crap. Uh, and lately, well, I won't go into some of the other things they've done for marketing. They also have the Wiz line, which is IP-based. But it's UDP, proprietary protocol, undocumented. Fortunately, it's a simple protocol, so people reverse engineered it. Thank you, Wireshark, and all the people who did it. So I wrote my own program to, the, to their UDP interface. But for example, if their pro stuff doesn't get an IP address, it seems to give up and never get it, as opposed to other things like Casmoda stuff, which seem to keep retrying. So I will use things that are out there, but I need a bridge to them in order to make them part of the whole. So the short answer is the things I want don't exist. Even Alexa in the kitchen. So Alexa, I, I've used a little, and I'd like to use it more. Uh, and if somebody knows how to write Alexa apps to do what I need, I'd appreciate it. It's just one more task to master. And specifically, let's say, what devices to find kitchen? Uh, Alexa is not designed, does not scale to 100 devices, 200 devices, 300 devices. And when you try to rebind, you replace a bulb, you don't have to tell Alexa, you have to tell Google Assistant what the thing is. You know, now I could try to make over your binding, identify Hubitat or some of it, but there's no simple, here's a, a way to connect and define what it is. So part of the things I want to do is build the bridges to those, but they're still bridges. The goal is, okay, what are the big ideas that make basically make me think in terms of binding of things? And the, the, serious, the real problem here is the economics. The economic of device, the economics of devices is broken. So you know about when the TV company's ranting you out, you buy a fancy TV and a report back to somebody in Shenzhen what you're watching. Okay. Now, some of them are caught doing it, some of them are not. But the reason they do this is you can't make any money selling this stuff. It's pure commodity. And the same <clears throat> light bulbs. So, if Wiz is going to send me an IP light bulb, how do they make their bulb more valuable than generic light bulbs, generic smart bulbs, a Tesla motor bulb? Well, that's the problem. They keep trying to do it. For a while, they're only selling via Home Depot, so they control the channel. It's futile because they're selling hardware with values in software, but they can't get the benefit of that value as long as if you can escape their silo. So that's a fundamental problem, which is why we need different market structure. This is why I'm so interested in Shelley. 
that they have kept it open and including make more open. They'll even encourage you. So you want to run cast mode on this? Flash it. They'll even tell you how. So I like it that they're able to do that. And that seems, unfortunately, more the exception than the rule. I don't want to spend my time fighting Sarno off or Toya about how to reprogram the devices when they're actively fighting to prevent me from doing it. But what I do miss is like the choice of form factors from Phillips, for example. That's why I sell some Phillips bulb, because it's the only bulbs I can get on those form factors. But companies like Ovi might be amateurish, but they're creating more interesting devices. I should encourage them to, to do others' devices. They're very inexpensive and very responsive. So when I complained about no land protocol, I said, but, oh, we're, we're actually doing that. And it's, and now it doesn't mean the whole product line is doing this, but part of the product line is very interested because there is somewhat of a hacker mindset. Unfortunately, some of the companies like WISE, W-Y-Z-E, don't get open. And they're still trying to do cheap, nice stuff, but they don't, you know, they, they, you hit a wall when you try to make creative use of it. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I was also asking, do you plan to expand to like uh, thermostats or fire alarms? Uh, okay, well, thermostat, I can. Equity is reachable via Home Assistant. They've got their own API. Uh, it's just there, I'm willing to use Home Assistant or the Equity native interface to go through, through the app. In other words, I'm not trying to automate things. I'm trying to sort of address, you know, functionality issues. It uh, turns out Home Assistant supports cameras, so I might, I want to figure out how to use, I could create a complete Home Assistant page. If you look at Home Assistant, you can create your own screens like I do just in Home Assistant, but it's dependent upon Home Assistant engine. I want to use some of this stuff. So one of the things I was looking forward to with the Nest uh, doorbell, hello, was listening to messages for turning on a light. Uh, especially a lot of the engineering was done locally. You know, I was encouraged. But since then, Google has cut back on the API promises. Their interfaces keep changing, the security. Now, I do understand that these large sites have hyper-security problems, and they're worried. But the price is, it means I can't do things. So if you saw that picture at the beginning where had all these relays and wires and stuff, one of the primary reasons for that was to take the, the Nest doorbell signal and turn it back into a binary switch, which I can then um, convert and send a message. Um, so, um, so the answer is yes. I would love to use all those. Love to use APIs interface. Don't want to re reinvent. Unfortunately, it's not really an option. Now, I, I, uh, you know, again, I, I will use as much as I can from Home Assistant, Habitat, and others. So they don't have to reinvent everything, but you know, support, there are still issues. Other question? I'm trying to recognize Bill R's background. Where is that? Uh, that is Commonwealth Pier Five, formerly known as World Trade Center Boston Head House. Viewed yes. over the viaduct from the uh, Seaport Hotel upper entrance. Okay, so this is a recent picture. Um, it, early this century. Oh, early this century. Okay. Oh, so this is. I mean, I remember before the hotel and all this. Right. When you have to drive all the way over. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just curious. If, if, if you. Uh, are uh, working a function uh, at the head house, you still are able to. It just takes oh, a yeah. little permission. But, but does it, go, it doesn't go all the way across, so it still does it. I forget. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen satellite trucks uh, parked at the top all of the, the, they the head house all, balcony. They, all do, they go all to the conference center, the Boston, whatever is conference center? Yeah, yeah. And taxis can, well, okay. they're, they're completely rebuilding the conference center in the head house currently so nothing's accessible at the moment but okay well, uh, I, I quite just, recently, taxis would come pick you up at the conference center turnaround yeah no i remember yes some of that yes uh any case other questions do you want to tour here or anything 
Um, I could give you a tour if I could just come up. That's not worth it, thank you. But, it, yeah, it is a pain. I would actually like to be doing more writing and stuff. But there is one feature it has for me. My, my way I handle ADHD is I use programming to relax. So the to-do list gives me a chance to relax. But, it, but the problem I have is I don't want to tackle any projects that can leave things broken. So I have to, I'm limited to things that have to be working by the end of the day. But uh, I'm, that's another major constraint. Uh, oh, great. Somebody looked up Graco's, yes. There is an advantage, by the way, studying the computers in the double E department. But even better, what you did in the 60s, and you knew more than your professors <laughs> about it. Of course, John could get better glasses. What? Say that again? Jabber can get better jazz, better glasses to read the to-do list. Oh, well, actually, there aren't enough pixels in what I did for you to see the actual to-do list. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, it's it, driving. What? Yeah. You, you used to be able to wear glasses all the time. In the past, uh, I don't know, like five or ten years, maybe. Uh, it, uh, it just, uh, I still need the glasses for driving, but I, uh, I can't really see anything out close to when I'm wearing the glasses. Oh, you see, I had a different problem. I discovered I was giving a talk in Sydney, and my glasses broke. My frame broke. And I was going to wear reading glasses as a temporary thing. I discovered, no, I've got astigmatism. <laughs> I can't just get glasses on the fly. Fortunately, I found some cheap frames. But, yeah, so it's not just about magnification. Anybody else playing with this kind of stuff? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I had the um, uh, let's go back. Like I use <clears throat> like the the past three houses I've, I've lived in. I, I've set outdoor lights um, mm -hmm. using smart bulbs, and and most bulbs come in with a with a built in app that seemingly goes online somewhere to look at a farmer's almanac. And it knows what time sunset and sunrise is throughout the year. Um, yeah, that's easy to get. There's a lot of APIs for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and then um, the uh, the the smart thermostats. Like um, uh, I, I still have a Newburyport and have one of those old oil furnaces mm -hmm. and a drafty house. And um, you know the, the algorithms help to make the heating more efficient and. and save money um so i found that's that's there was that's to be a good investment uh yeah uh, my hvac guy was in recently he said he, he re he's been removing a lot of nests <laughs> <laughs> because unless you're in such a situation it, it, it's too smart for people but one other thing important aspect of this is how many of you ha are living in houses versus apartments yeah my condo i live in a condo yeah, yeah well, I'm in a yeah, the nice thing, how many of you can cut holes in walls whenever you want to? As long as you don't cut into the neighbor's wall. Well, <laughs> okay. I, the, owning your own home doesn't necessarily make that totally easy because I've got horsehair plaster. Oh, it, it's not totally easy. And I, I, it's more than rewiring. I, I, I'll put it this way. The, the reason I call an electrician is they're better cutting holes in walls than I am. I can do the wiring, but I need them to cut the holes. Yeah. I think the but first I mean, thing I... First thing I did after I, I, I got to the place where I live now is uh, was having an electrician come and wire and run the Ethernet. Um, the, old, the, the the first floor is usually pretty easy, you know, because you can get to the basement. But the second floor is usually the trickier one. Well, that's why I've got a lot of wireless. You have Ethernet in a lot of places, but there's a lot of wireless. But in 19, I did this in 1990. At 93, I ran the... I future with my house with the most advanced Ethernet wiring I can get. Cat three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have um, my condo here. 
we moved in in August. Uh, the only major hole I had to make in the wall is um, coax because I wanted to uh, well for Comcast, so I wanted to. Uh, no, Comcast doesn't need coax anymore. What? Uh, well, I it, it, basic. Well, with with Verizon, I I use their box of Mocha Bridge, so everything's over Wi over IP. The new yeah. Comcast set up boxes are generic IP boxes now. Uh, yeah. The Comcast boxes are all wireless or Wi-Fi, but I wanted this computer to be wired for performance. Yeah, but why? Do you, so why did you wire it to Ethernet? Uh, because all I had to do was drill a hole through the wall, and I had a coax in the next. Uh, well, that's no. If you had the coax, I could see we're using. I, I even have a two point five gigabit Mocha bridge. Yeah, okay. it's a mocha to a mocha. If, if I wouldn't put coax. I'm saying I wouldn't have put coax in unless it was years ago. I mean, years ago, yes, you had to do it. Yeah. But these well, days. <coughs> like upstairs where I am right now, we've got uh, two coax. We've got two coax connections, one in a, in a bedroom and another in a like where the TV is. You know, neither of those are used. So what we did is drilled across and just, we didn't even drill to the other wall. We had the coax between the walls, so we just pulled the coax here. Uh, one use of coax, by the way, is to pull the Ethernet cable through the wall. Yeah, it's just, it just was so, convenient. Like you glue it to the end, you pull the Ethernet through with the coax, where the coax goes. Yeah, you're talking about two inches. Yeah. But uh, what we're uh, someplace I can never find things when I need them. I, I did find a pair of two point five uh, uh, gigabit Mocha boxes. Yeah. So uh, I, yeah, no, I, I it's not terrible to to use coax, but uh, you wouldn't want to put it do it new. Yeah, because the everything else in the house is Wi Fi. So yeah, all no, the TVs. You know, I find I've, I've got between 275 and 300 endpoints, depending on what I'm trying out. Yeah. And the vast majority are Wi-Fi, which is why I can't get a consumer box. Turns out if you get consumer routers, they all have a 256 limit. <laughs> you know, and think about this, a time when that seemed big. So that, that's why I see a 172.20 address here. So other questions? How, any, any, so who, will, who who is doing a lot of home control stuff now? Which of you? Yeah, I, think, I think right now, like, um, uh, like I said, I'm doing, I'm doing the smart bulbs. Uh, the Nest, the fire detectors. Yeah, I do have the Nest fire detectors. Yeah, okay. well, it's especially good, like, because we have pets, and if we're not, at, you know, if we're not at home, it's good to know when the fire alarm went off. Yeah, it's also multi-story. The, the one problem I had with the Nest, I heard it going off. Um, you know, there was a test thing, then I realized it wasn't the Nest; it was a bird. The same kind of sound. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I had in in a previous condo I had, I did have the upstairs using um, essentially uh, remote lights. I forget what protocol I was using. And uh, the actually the can that we put the lights in was actually uh, wired and not the light bulbs. Right, the but I was able to turn them, turn them on and off remotely. But it uses what an older control system relays or something. Yeah, that was several years ago. Yeah, I no, just I mean, forget yeah. The protocol I was using. Back when X10 was the most advanced. Uh... Yeah, now, it's amazing how long X10 lasted because all, it, it it didn't try to second guess what you were doing. I know that's 
kind of tangentially related, but um, uh, when you know when when I had the free time, I was really into um, trying to parse digital data over radio, um, just just kind of like scanning the frequency spectrum for for digital communication, and then trying okay. to uh, uh, decode it. Yes, yes. Using like a, a SDR, like a software defined radio device. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely a lot of fun. Yeah. And you too can publish your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's nothing, yeah, nothing really too interesting. I think the only um, new development, like there used to be uh, police bands. Yeah. Um, police bands gone now? Well, they they they're using um, a digital, uh, an encrypted digital voice solution, where it's sending a digital signal over, um, like a narrow FM. Yeah, more more and more departments are mm -hmm. going uh, digital encrypted. So I mean, it's amazing how long it took. But, track but, of what the cops are screwing up. Yeah, yeah I mean, there, there's some there's some open source solutions with some common encryption algorithms that that can get it can decode some of them in real time but i think any ones that use more advanced ones are harder to, to crack what, what they should really be using is a public packet infrastructure but we don't have that yet but that's a whole conversation in its own right but well the cop car i mean that's a whole nother discussion it's sort of i think well will call super glue technology where you get all these disparate things, you glue them all together in the car, they don't work together, but at least you, you, you have a big van just to hold all the different uncaught, unconnected yeah. technology. You know, I mean, part of the problem is how many people understand how this stuff works underneath. It's all magic. So, so any other questions or topics? Or? Curiosities, stories from when I was a kid, <laughs> discovering you, oh, you could hook up a phone to a radio and listen to the uh, uh, Long John Nebel, then James Randi and, and Gene Shepard under the blankets in, in the middle of the night when they didn't know it. <laughs> well, actually, I'm curious about like, you know, how do you go about like writing an assembler? Like you just wake up one day and like, I'm, I'm going to write an assembler. No, uh, <laughs> but it, no. Uh, you, remember there was no choice when I was a kid in many cases. I, I mean, did, I, did you have like before that, did you actually have to look at the actual machine code and figure out like, okay, here's the, here's the letter a, no, here's the number four. No, luckily we had assembly programs to take Mm. Care of that housekeeping. I mean, I was actually when I first learned to program. Fortunately, I was taking a class at Hunter College, and they taught us machine language of the 1620 as well as Fortran with a Mary Dulciani teacher. I remember her name, uh, but they only let me write one program in Fortran. But the good thing is, I was taught how the machine worked underneath. Then 1620 in a structure where you give an opcode and one or two operands and a flag and all, all that, and it made a lot of sense to me. Uh, to this day, I can type 160000 to clear the 1620 memory. And I was, wasn't sure about it, so I did check to find an article about it, confirmed it. Unfortunately, then I looked at the author article, it was me, which wasn't a very good <laughs> way to find confirmation. Uh, but later on, the, uh, uh, you know, the IBM 794. I didn't write machine code on it, but I did look at the machine code to read the principles of operation. And some wonderful instructions. Like, how many of you know Lisp? Yeah. I used to, did, okay. I did a little bit in Lisp, not much. Do you know where the terms, you know where the terms car and critter come from? It's been around longer than any of us. Okay, it stands for Contents of Address Register and Contents of Decrement Register based on the IBM uh, 7090 or 794 instruction set. Okay. So it's that kind of sort of arcane knowledge. But you mentioned 7044 being a 36-bit uh, yeah. machine. That was a 15-bit address. So 36-bit 
address them 6-bit opcode and two 15-bit fields or 3-bit opcode or the modifiers. So, the, you know, so those kind of things I just learned. Uh, you know, it's enough of a nerd that I would enjoy going to the IBM. IBM gave away free manuals in the old days. You go to the IBM offices on Madison yeah. Avenue, 7th Street, raid the manual libraries. Uh, but, I used to have a stack of them. But Wait, I had that, to learn was that in Manhattan, Manhattan or was that in Boston? Manhattan. Manhattan okay. So, but my first job, so, but working up on, at, I'm trying to remember the first, so when I got the job at White Weld in 1966, I was, everything was in assembler language for the operating system. Uh, Fortran would have been a very suitable language anyway. Uh, so we just wrote assembler. Um, I, I, this seemed natural. I mean, that's the thing about writing assembler. It might be tedious, but it seemed natural. I mean, when you write a program, you, it, picture you just have a few variables. You have any number of variables, but when you did an operation instead of A plus B, you would say, you know, take A, put the register, add B to the register, save it. So you just write out the steps. So there's nothing, it, it's not really that arcane. It's yeah. more tedious. And I would be dis, I mean, I'm one of the programmers who would write a semi language and put the structure like jump three steps, you know, five structures ahead in a block of code. You know, I was not that dumb. Or I gave the example of the, the branch instruction in 360, which allowed you to patch the bits instead of having a separate flag. And some people would do practice like that. So at least I had an early sense of aesthetics and programming. So if you discipline, you can actually make it some quite visible. So in wrote Visical, there were no go-tos in the assembly language. It's written in assembly language because how else can you get this fit in 6502, which is an machine, all this. But I had I had a challenge of how to write code I can understand and debug uh, in assembler. So it was all you know, basically no go-tos. Go-tos themselves are not even for mathematic reasons, but it becomes spaghetti code. You cannot trace the dynamic state by looking at the static state. Now, where I had to, but if you know, it was cheap, so I'd have a call return instruction. We said, this is a call followed by return, which is really a jump, but you knew that it would return to the caller. So when you're writing assembly, the key thing is good practices. Like I said, the example I gave earlier, don't leave something in a register or multiple pages without warning people. So it's actually not that hard to do, just tedious. But uh, but it, what was strange was in the early days, so I had multiple jobs. There's the multi group at MIT, which is high level language for the beginning, PL1 and everything, much better than IBM PL1. In my, my outside job, I'd be programming the IBM uh, 360 in assembler, and then I switched to using IBM lousy PL1 to write debuggers and tools. So I would go to high level languages. So one story was in the old days with the punch cards, when you made a change, you would submit an update deck, but you wouldn't read through the whole program. You would submit an update deck, which would run upon and generate the new deck. So you had a history of the changes. Well, you're all you're not going to type an update deck. Yet the old line programs that did, so there are programs that generate the update decks dynamically. So I wrote tools to sort of tame assembly language. So it's not it's the same way, you know, I say don't write in C, that's cruel and human punishment. Sugar assembly language. I can do it, but only if I have to. And there are less and less instances I have to. And it turns out programming in like JavaScript has advantages over statically compiled code because you're compiling on the fly, so you don't have to worry about all the edge cases. The edge cases happen, program will adjust, but you don't get the performance hit by having to check for them every time. So a lot of the concepts of programming have also changed. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, what I'm finding now, especially with cloud computing costs um, skyrocketing, is that um, a lot of people are looking for those to, to, to make those efficiencies where you know, if you shave a few cycles off or, or gain a, you know, gain a few milliseconds um, in an application where you're, you're, you're concurrently doing, you know, possibly hundreds of thousands of transactions. Um, uh, trillions. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, but I, I'm, at least I'm, I'm finding a culture that is, is going back to look to, to make those, those efficiencies and then look kind of looking away from parsed languages where there's the simplicity is cost of a performance penalty. Well, yeah, but uh, again, you're also getting some people who just like to twiddle and put the hands into the mic because it feels good. Uh, I understand why we have language like Rust and Go and people experimenting with how do we do this low-level stuff. Uh, so if I had to do it, this CUDA programming and things like that, mass and C, so I still have those you know, vestigial skills. But for what I do, it turns out, for example, the cooperative threading of JavaScript is a major advantage for me over the kind of uh, threading I get in like C sharp. Yeah. We have to worry about all these locks and there's too much freedom. So there's a with the grain aspect too. And the trick for a lot of things, the twiddling you're talking about, uh, is there are two answers. One, yes, if it costs a lot, you can afford to bring programmers on and everything and you know tune it. But you get your efficiency by understanding the program. And that's why I see where the Rust and O-type language are, more, are better than C++, which is just larding stuff over the crap that exists and sort of silting up to the extent that anything you want to do requires three triple upside down colons in a row. And then upside down, it won't work. But if you really want efficiency, what I suggested back in the 60s was you built a little automatic chip uh, factory that will turn your algorithm into chips. And that's what we do now with specialized processors. Yeah. By the way, my thesis was on the cloud back in 74. <laughs> was that what do you think time frame was? Yeah, I, I remember just since we're telling stories, my, when I first worked for the bank, I had to maintain a program that had line. What? Which bank? Oh, I worked the Southeast First National Bank of Miami. Okay. At least you were not at Fleet or Bank of America. No, no, it wasn't. Well, it's now part of Bank of America. Oh, it, everything is. You mean Bank yeah. of Italy. Right. <laughs> but uh, I had a program that was nobody in my group wanted to touch. And it had code that mo it had self modifying COBOL code. <laughs> Some, yes. Yeah, which so, it, it, it's it's a, called an alter statement. Oh, the alter statement, yes. And it was the alter, hmm. alter return to such and such. And then execute. And nobody could understand it because this was on a borrower's computer. Mm -hmm. It's like the come from statement. And I looked, the first time I looked at the program, I said, wait a minute, that's a Baller instruction. What? A Baller. Oh, Baller, yeah. Great register, IBM. What they did was it was an accounting program and they took it from IBM that was written in IBM Assembler and converted it to COBOL. And, you know, those features were in there. And everybody that ever touched that program hated that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't understand exactly what that was. It was nothing more than a subroutine call. Yeah, yeah. Did, did, how did COBOL do subroutines? What? Dad, it, the COBOL has procedures, right? Yeah, you would perform in COBOL. Okay, so it sounds like we were getting into people who were, were translating COBOL with an assembly mindset of the go-to rather than... Uh, it, was, it was done mechanically. They wrote oh, a okay. oh, yes. Oh, oh that's... Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I can understand wonder. exactly. What yeah. you, somebody should have written was, was a three, six, an interpreter for 360 instructions. Yeah. So it was really, you know, the code was where they uh, had taken an accounting system that was written in IBM Assembler, IBM 360 Assembler, and they converted it to Burroughs COBOL. 
Not for his elbow, though, I guess. Yeah, and the COBOL programmers I work with hated that program. They they gave it to the first newbie that came around. And nobody thought of rewriting the thing for it to be readable? Yeah. But when I looked at the... I uh, took a course, and I, I had learned assembler in graduate school. Mm -hmm. And so I learned... Um, when I first got to the bank programming, the bank uh, data center, I studied IBM Assembler. Mm -hmm. So that when I took over that program, I looked at it and said, oh, I know what this is. Yes. And How good was the translation otherwise? Excuse me? How good a job did they do translating it otherwise? I didn't understand you. How good a job did they do translating it otherwise? Uh, it was almost line by line. It's not very, not a very good job. It was done mechanically for most parts. Some was hand done. Depends on the program. Yeah. Uh, and so nobody liked that system. I bet that program is still running today. Uh, could very well be. It's just, again, how many of you have looked at the daily WTF? The daily what? The site, the daily WTF. Let me make sure I got the name right. I haven't, no. Not in decades. You're so familiar with the per site. We go find it. Um, <clears throat> Sounds like something better back in the 90s. There it is. To those into it, let me put this one back here. It might be too painful to look at some of the examples. Yeah. <clears throat> but, yeah. But, I mean, there is, the problem I had even in the 60s was how is programming taught? It was taught sort of as mechanical skill, not sort of philosophical, intellectual uh, undertaking. Yeah, I learned to program in the 60s, but I went into the Army right after uh, college mm -hmm. and learned to fly helicopters instead. It could be more fun. But... It was. Maybe not when you're getting shot at, but... Okay, so, so you, went still, over, you went over there. Vietnam was a really, really beautiful country. Mm -hmm. Have you been back? Excuse me? Have you been back? No. A couple of my friends have, but I have not. We'll see what happens when quadcopters con controlled by computers become the norm. It becomes too easy to fly them. Yeah. Well, I, know, um, I live in um, Squim, Washington. and um, Which Washington? Oh, Squim, Squim Washington. Uh, uh, where? Here, let me... Um, I mean, if, I used to commute to Washington, so I was curious. Yeah. Um, let's see. You work at Microsoft, right? Or did you work at an office in... No, I, and there was no office here. Oh, okay. So it was a uh, <laughs> uh, Um, Let me My daughter yeah. almost slugged him one time. What <laughs> one time? My daughter was working as a waitress in Cambridge, oh. and mm -hmm. uh, she almost uh, slugged him. I can understand. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I was going to say the, um, so I, I live about uh, a couple hours from Seattle. And a couple that, hours, that's more to us. Actually, it's probably another half an hour that involves a ferry ride, too. Mm -hmm. um, oh, through the other direction. Yeah, yeah, I'm just about across the channel from Victoria, B.C. Um, but I know we have a big supply chain issue here. Um, I, I, there's a few big box stores where trucks show up all the time and i think just recently i think amazon started 
um, they built a warehouse somewhat near here. So, here. so oh, where I live. Um, oh, are you out in Washington now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I was going to say, like, well. um, yes. if, you know, like where, where I live, because we're, we're farther away from, you know, the urban areas, like having unmanned drones, you know, um, that we're able to move commerce to, say, like a warehouse here. Um, well, look at this Mark Rober. Has a great video about drones used for drug delivery in Rwanda, <laughs> but also the head of Amazon in developing the technology. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, like having drones that, you know, say if, if trucks were the place. Well, actually, I know somebody will fly a helicopter there for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's also because the, you know, the, the housing prices have, have gone up significantly here. So people, you know, for, for reasons, you know, want, want to come out and move farther away to more affordable areas that, um, and do remote work. But then you, you know, one thing I didn't realize here is that, you know, I'm so rural that, you know, things like, like getting a doctor or finding a vet, um, like certain services are harder to obtain here because it's more, more remote. Um, yeah, I, I see where you are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I did take a seaplane tour once. It turns out there's a seaplane that went from Seattle to Victoria. But if you took the round trip, it was a fraction the price of the one way trip. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was a ferry that, that goes to Victoria, um, yeah. like one town over. But I haven't been there in a while. No, you just need to learn to fly. That's all. <laughs> I think housing prices have been going crazy everywhere. Yeah. I, I look around today and I, I see how uh, prices like uh, like $1.8 million for something that 10 years ago would have cost $400. Yeah, but at the same time, like I see like with remote work that, you know, you, you can find the remote, you know, some place more affordable, albeit more remote, but yeah, uh, time I, I'm saying if, if – if someone solved those supply chain issues where, you know, uh, like say where I live could get the same amenities and services as, as like, say if someone lived closer to Seattle, um, yeah. that'd make life a lot better. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens with all that. On the, the layers view, mm -hmm. well, it's still pretty dense. I mean, it's still a pretty big area, you right? Yeah, actually, the the population. Oh, there's uh, a Costco. You've got a Costco. What are you complaining about? And a Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> You've got civilization of sorts. <laughs> Somewhat, yeah. But like, like I said, like, but issues like, like I said, like finding a primary care doctor here took months. Oh, yeah, no. It, it, for medical care, yeah, this is the place to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say the, um, uh, I guess RCN is part of some larger conglomerate, and uh, we get uh, cable from them. Um, well, actually, here, separate issue I'll pitch to you. Are you connected politically there? No. Okay, because if you do, the town should just own its connectivity. Why are you having a foreign carpetbagger company controlling mm -hmm. your ability to communicate? Now, my, my last house, I had a fiber. I, I was part of the county fiber network. No, but you should just own its infrastructure. It should just be open. Yeah. Look at my uh, my packet, uh, public packet infrastructure proposal. Yeah. Now, before I, before I lived here, I was getting symmetrical gigabit fiber for about 90 bucks a month. Yeah, I mean, but the point is, why it should be a per month charge? How much a month do you pay for your for your sidewalk? Sidewalk? So, yeah, I mean, yeah. Is, is there a turnstile mm -hmm. in front of your house? Don't you subscribe a sidewalk subscription? I I pay uh, for my sidewalk. That's part of the square. Okay. It's assessed against my. No, it's assessed, but you don't have a, you don't mm -hmm. subscribe to the sidewalk and have a turnstile in front of your house. Yeah. 
you're basically arguing that it should be it should, it should be utility be infrastructure yeah. not a utility infrastructure. careful bob you keep saying things like that somebody <laughs> might take it as a suggestion it is <laughs> i mean sidewalk is a service well, we're actually getting there with roads. Now that we can do electronic car things, we're going to start. To and in Tokyo, and, and we're now selling oxygen in the grocery store. Well, well, people look at people buy bottled water. How stupid can you be? You know, but um, pounds, it's the last necessary. Yeah, hopefully we'll get to the infrastructure point when telecom collapses, since it does not have a viable economic model. Always, oh, why? Some people still have landlines. And well, why are landlines more more susceptible to scammers than uh, oh that's because okay. the conversation I had with uh, Craig McCoy years ago. I said, look, Celia has all these protocols. Uh why do you have them on landlines? He said, Well, I don't make money on landlines. But I, my landline is a Google Voice line. Okay. Still get scammers. Hmm. Yeah, we have a landline. And the only time we use it is at my wife's phone. For some reason, all the calls that she was getting went directly to voicemail, mm -hmm. even though we have uh, calls over Wi-Fi. And so she started using that, but only in the case where if she doesn't get a call or something for a friend. Well, I have, I, I have Google Voice coming in OB High Box over my Ethernet. Yeah. Okay, I think if people have any other questions. Okay, I'm going to shut down the um, YouTube. Okay, hello, bye all.